let's say you're working and the uh, paramedics bring in a patient who's unresponsive, you put them on the monitor and you see this. What is that? Yes, it's a kind of VTAC, not the normal VTAC that we're used to seeing, which looks more like this, in which the morphology is pretty similar throughout. This one actually looks different throughout, so the morphology doesn't stay the same. So uh, this is actually called polymorphic VTAC. So your guy's unstable with a VTAC, what are you going to do? You're going to shock him. So let's say you do that, and now the rhythm changes to this. So what is this? This is a sinus rhythm, but there's a very characteristic distinguishing feature here. Look at this QT interval here. It's huge. And so when you have polymorphic VT in the face of a prolonged QT, what is that? That's torsad. So now this distinction is very important, especially this QT, because the treatment for polymorphic VTAC, after you shock them, you start them on some sort of antiarrhythmic, maybe like amiodarone. If you give this drug to a patient with torsad, you're going to kill them. So let's take a step back first and look at intervals. And so it's always important to look at the intervals on your EKGs. So first one we'll look at is the PR interval. And the normal range for that is anywhere between 120 and 200. Anything shorter than 120, well, you better worry about WPW. Anything greater than 200, then you're worried about an AV block. Well, the next interval we'll look at is the QRS. I do it pretty narrow, but it, there's usually some width to it. And it's usually going to be less than 120 milliseconds. And remember that each small box is 40, so that would be three small boxes. And so if you have anything that is greater than this, then you're worried about some sort of conduction delay, like maybe a left bundle branch block. Another interval we need to look at is the QT interval. And this is best measured in maybe V3 or V4 or any uh, lead where the T wave is about 2 millimeters. This measurement is taken from the beginning of the Q to the end of the T. And it is very rate dependent. In fact, you need to correct for the rate. And so there are various formulas to do this. The first one is called the Bazet's formula, and that is the measured QT, so this distance, over the square root of the RR distance, so this distance. The formula is actually a little more complicated than that. You actually have to take the average of three consecutive beats in three contiguous leads, so you'd have to be calculating square roots nine times. Another problem with this is people say that it is not very accurate when the patient is very bradycardic or tachycardic, and so there's another formula, which is the Fredericia one, and that takes the cube root of the RR. And there's even uh, graphs you can look at, nomograms, that can help you figure out what the corrected QTC is. So how do I figure it out? I just look at the top of the EKG. The computer is pretty good at making these calculations, so that's what I do. So what's normal for a QTC? Well, it differs also between men and women. Men are going to be have a rate at 440 and women at 460. And you'll frequently see uh, rates that are greater than this, and they're not so worrisome. The real number you got to look at is the number at which arrhythmias happen, and that's anything that's greater than 500 milliseconds. And so that's when you start worrying. Now there's also a cheap way of telling when, when there's a, an, an ele a QRS that's, a QT that's big. And that is to take two R's and mark them off like that, and then draw a line in the middle like that. And then you say, on what side of the line does the T wave fall? If it falls on this side, well, then that's probably okay. If it falls on this side, then that's too long. And so in this case, you can see it's too long. So if we're going to talk about torsad, we should probably also talk about QTCs, really prolonged QTCs. So what causes a prolonged QT? The first thing we got to look at are lights. And you're looking at the hypo everything, so hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, and hypomagnesemia. All kinds of meds can do it, from uh, Benadryl to antipsychotics, certain antibiotics like Levaquin. So find one of those lists and compare it to the medications that the patient is on. And there are other things that can cause it too, like cardiac ischemia, 
increased ICP, like from a head bleed, hypothermia, and congenital or inherited mutations of certain potassium and calcium channels. So these are commonly referred to as the acquired causes, and then this is the congenital cause. So how are we going to treat this? Let's go back to our initial patient who had a polymorphic VT. So what's the first thing you're going to do? Yeah, shock them, that's right. You're going to cardiovert them. And then if they convert, you're going to look at that QT interval and decide if it's prolonged or not. If it was, if the QT was normal, then you had a polymorphic VTAC. If it was prolonged, then you have a torsade. Now, the thing that you're worried about is if they're going to go back into that rhythm. So you want to give them an antiarrhythmic, a med that's going to stop them from doing that. So if it's prolonged, if it's normal, if it's just polymorphic VTAC, you can give amiodarone, procainamide, or even lidocaine. But if you give amiodarone or procainamide to a patient who's in torsade, that's going to further prolong this QT interval and put them into a refractory torsade that you're not going to be able to get them out of. In other words, you're going to kill them. So for uh, torsade, what you want to put them on, on is a magnesium. You can give them a bolus uh, and you can repeat that bolus later if you need to or even put them on a mag drip. And of course you're going to want to treat whatever underlying abnormality there is. So give them some potassium if they need it or uh, treat whatever, you know, check whatever medications that they're on. Now let's say something different happened. Let's say you had the polymorphic VTAC and you shocked them and you know what? Nothing happened. They stayed in that same rhythm. What are you going to do next? Yeah, you can give them magnesium. Give them two grams of magnesium and see if that does anything. But let's say that didn't work. What are you going to do after that? Well, you can overdrive, pace them. And this really comes from the fact that tachycardias are a little bit more protective against torsade than slower rhythms. There was a study done that plotted heart rate against the QT and what they found was that there were way more episodes of uh, torsade that were happening in the, tachy in the bradycardic areas, in the normal rhythms, than they were in the tachycardic areas. So this tachycardia can actually be a little bit protective. And so how are we going to make our patient tachycardic? Yeah, you could put pacer pads on them, transcutaneous pacing. And you're just going to crank that thing up to 100 to 120. And you may actually even need rates greater than 120. Sure, a transvenous pacer would work much better, but you're not going to be able to put one of those in quick enough. So you, put, you start with the transcutaneous pacers and just crank it up. The idea being, again, that we're going to get them tachycardic and hoping that that protective effect is going to get them out of this rhythm. Or you could even chemically pace them and give, this, give them this non-selective beta agonist, isoproterenol. And so the beta-1 is going to do the heart rate and speed up the heart rate. The beta-2 is going to cause some vasodilation, so you might see some hypotension with that. So just be, you know, be cognizant that that's going to happen. And you can look up the dosing for adults and kids for the isoproterenol, but here it is. Now, if at this point they're still in this, this torsade, uh, you'd call your electrophysiologist and, uh, and see if they maybe need to put in a transvenous pacer. And now, why don't we actually look at an EKG with a prolonged QT? So, it's kind of small, but it may be hard to see, but let me mark it up for you. So let's first do the, the cheat method. So put a line on the first one R, the other R, and then draw a line in the middle when you see on what side does the T fall and look at that it falls on the wrong side so that's an elevated QT this patient had actually presented with uh, hypokalemia and I think the potassium was somewhere around 2.2 or something like that and so the treatment of course is to fix the cause and hypo is one of the things so you'd, you'd give them potassium and we know that uh, hypokalemia is often uh, accompanied by hypomagnesemia, so give them some mag too, which will also be protective against any torsade that might happen. So this was prolonged QT and torsade in a little over nine minutes. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. Adios.